Now, we have been discussing something that we believe is very, very important, and that is the subject of morality. A moral is a principle uh, that governs character and conduct. Uh, and the fact is that we are being uh, bombarded with this from various uh, means uh, in the, the times in which we live. However, we believe that morality really is only a small part of the Christian way of life. We believe that true morality involves Christian integrity, which means that you are moral in every aspect of the law, and that's different from what is thought today. Uh, for example, uh, I uh, watched um, a show it involved the NYPD Blue show. You know, they've got a, a tall, slender, uh, good-looking fellow. I believe he's a Mexican there. He's the star of the show. They've got another fellow by the name of Sibowitz, and, and he's another uh, star, and so forth. And uh, the, the gist of the show was that um, uh, it was about racial um, overtones and, and uh, things like that, racial issues. And the partner of this guy, because of some of the things that a black man was doing, happened to explode on this black man. He did not use the so-called N-word, but he came that close to it. And after it was all over, a reporter came to him, and the guy used the N-word in a different context, and the reporter published it as though he was calling this guy by that name. Now, just a little bit later, the star of the show uh, came to him and said, I've got problems with that. It's immoral for you to have unloaded on that fellow and use those racial terms. And so the star of the show was putting this guy down with regard to his morality in using racial slurs against this guy. And he did say some pretty mean things. He said, I have problems with that. And so he was the moral hero of the day as he went home with his girlfriend that they are not married to and that he was telling all these things to in bed. And you think, you know, he's the, he's the moral hero. And there he goes home to, in, in a situation where, where they're not married, and he's turning out the light relating these things to her as they're preparing to, to make love or whatever. And, uh, and, you, and you think of the mixed messages that are out there in the world with regard to morality. Now, wait a minute. How can this be moral, but this be moral as well? How, you know, I mean, immoral, but this be moral uh, uh, when obviously the, the one fella uh, that uh, the police officer unloaded upon really deserved it. What he deserved was a bullet right between the eyes, but he couldn't do that, and so he just exploded. And uh, anyway, we're talking about morality and the way people view morality. Whose moral code are you going to use? It must be God's code, and the second thing about it, it must not be in just certain areas, it must be in all areas. That's what integrity is. God wants us to have integrity. If we're to be like Jesus Christ, he kept all of the law, not just part of the law. He didn't just pick and choose. He says, it's all for me. And we know that because he fulfilled it as its antitype in a perfect sacrifice for sin. He fulfilled it as its complement. Here were the standards. Here was his life. He measured up. Now, through the filling of the Holy Spirit and application of doctrine, the church is to do the same thing. We are to be washed with water by the word that will not have spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. We're to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. The righteousness of the law, the complete morality or the integrity of the law is something that should be applied to us. Okay. Then we took the law and began to separate it. And obviously it is uh, uh, separated. Actually, you know, the law of Moses contains 613 laws. 
613 specific laws that Israel had to follow. Some of them, of course, as we have mentioned, in, involved in family relationships, involved the priesthood, the tabernacle, uh, involved their sacrifices, involved their uh, food, uh, involved the sanitation of the camp, and on and on we could go. But there were 613 laws that they had to, um, to learn and live by. Some of the laws, uh, if they broke them, meant their death. For example, uh, I um, had a, an interesting uh, uh, question going out uh, this morning, and that was, if Paul talks about nine of the ten, which one was left out of Paul's writings? And that is the Sabbath day. That is a national work stop each day, and you cannot have a, uh, a non-covenant nation having a national work stop each uh, day as they had with Israel. You see, uh, we have people who work on uh, the the first day of the week, which is not the Christian Sabbath, but the day we uh, traditionally gather together and so forth. But they could not work. You had to shut everything down. Uh, your servants could not work. Your animals could not work. You had to prepare your food a day ahead of time. Otherwise, you were killed for breaking that law. Under grace, you can break it and you're not killed. However, as these are mandatory under law, for fear of death, under grace they are voluntary and especially for believers. If you want to please the Lord, you have to um, obey these laws. However, some of these laws, as we're going to see, are for believer and unbeliever alike. Some of these laws are for divine establishment, and establishment is for those who have believed in Christ and those who have not. The last six, and this is where the confusion lies, the last six have to do especially with establishment. Now, before we get ahead of ourselves, let's just go over the 10, and then we'll break up the law in two other ways. No other gods. This means that anybody who has ever lived that has any other God other than the God of the Bible, which uh, refers to him as the true and living God, is immoral. That's something that is misunderstood. Morality today is confined to just a few, uh, few things like uh, uh, adulterous affairs, drugs, and the rest. However, if you do not have Jesus Christ as your Savior and the true God as your Father, you are immoral. All ten are moral laws, and that's what's forgotten. We, we throw it out or we just mean a few of them. We have to take all ten or take none. And number one says, no other gods before me. That's why, of course, if you're going to put uh, the Ten Commandments in, uh, in our courtrooms and in our public schools and, and say, this is the law. Anybody who doesn't believe in God, who is an agnostic, or anybody who has another conception of God, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and so forth, all of them are immoral and lawbreakers. They are criminals. They were so in Israel under penalty of death. That is why today we have to be very careful in the application of this. Now, anybody who has any other God than the God of the Bible is immoral. Secondly, any conceptions of God, whether in an outer or a mental image, those people are immoral. Anyone who calls something God or says that God sanctions something which he does not is a blasphemer. Blasphemy is immoral. It is part of the 10 moral laws of God, all right? The principle of Sabbath keeping, okay? Though we do not keep the Sabbath, the principle of giving God at least one day of the week is still there in the writings of the Apostle Paul. When you come together or assemble together on the first day of the week. So uh, today, there will have been people as they do every Sunday. Uh, we've, got, we've got neighbors around here who, um, who uh, complain about uh, uh, Parked cars, you know, we, we park just a little too close and they get all upset and so forth. And they would be called good people 
by the neighborhood. They spent Sunday with their children. They went and had a picnic and the like. And I just want to say that the leaders of the, that the household, they're immoral. They're immoral. Why? Because the principle is with God is you at least give him one day of your life during the week. You, you organize your life around that so that you can learn his word, worship him, honor him, learn how to obey him and the like. But the majority of Americans, that's why it always cracks me about having a national day of prayer. Whoopee ding, a national day of prayer. Everybody in Evansville is going to have a, what about just in, her, in our community? Let's have a community day of prayer. Nonsense. Where are they? How come our pews aren't a fool if they really wanted to worship and know God? They are immoral people. And people want to know, well, I've been good. Why did I get sick? Well, why did grandpa die? Why don't why my kids get sick? I have been really good. Uh, you know, uh, a, a real good neighbor. Some, somebody got sick over there and I brought them a bowl of soup and I've just been such a good person. I only said GD and hell uh, just a, a couple times this week and, uh, and I was really, really sorrowful for it. Those people are, what happens to them is they are immoral and they don't know it. They don't have the right God. They don't have the right image of God. They use his name in vain and they neglect church on Sunday. Those are not good people. They're immoral people. Now you understand what I'm saying. You have to understand that. Secondly, or fifthly rather, is the bit of honoring your parents. You see, what God is saying here is not just to recognize them for being the source of life, but honoring them by your life being what it should be. Obviously, if you are immoral in the first four, you come to five and said, honor your father and your mother. How can you do that if you are immoral? You're not, you're not exalting them one bit, you see. If you go to hell, if you're a Christ rejecter, if you hate the Bible, if you live uh, your life for yourself, or you are a perpetrator of a false religion or a false gospel, you don't honor your parents by leading yourself and others to the pit of hell. That's not uh, parental honor. And so therefore, taken in the context here, honoring your parents is being a person of integrity and, and a true True honor goes back to them because they raised you right. Now, uh, we're, we're living in a situation where you can't win. Uh, what, what do I mean by that? Well, if a child does wrong, in, in, in some cases they, they do wrong, and parents who are conscientious take them and punish them, oh, it's abuse. Then you go to like what happened in the Wisconsin area where the child went out and destroyed property. And you know who they prosecuted? The parents. They prosecuted. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> OK, fine. You're going to prosecute me. Then on this side, we're going to have a little laying on of hands. Do we believe on the laying on of hands? You bet your bottom dollar in that case. We're going to have a little laying on of hands, a little meeting of the mind, a little board uh, of, of education on the seat of knowledge over here. Fine, you're going to prosecute me, then keep your hands off me when I discipline my child. What's wrong with people? I can't figure this out. Anyway, well, I'm going to preach instead of teaching the word of God. Honor your parents. And we, we need to help our parents and our, and our teachers. And then the, then the silly parents who don't do this. And then I, because I've got two school teachers here who know exactly what I'm talking about. They do not discipline their children. They blame everybody else but themselves for, for their children's misbehavior. And then they do bad in school. And you know whose fault it is? The teacher's fault. And that is immoral in in my opinion placing the blame on someone else when the blame lies with you is bearing false witness it's telling a lie to get yourself off the hook okay well I uh, I'll calm down now I'll take my Maalox and and uh, put my neck back in place for the, for the stress see it's, it's okay well <laughs> Can I have the next week off, please? <laughs> okay. 
it's, it's like, you see, the problem is this. It's like Brian told me, that his problem and my problem are the same. We think too much, and that's true. I, I spend life, a lot of times, thinking of, of how Christianity distorts the truth and how, and how people misapply these things so that we're in a mess today. And uh, then I get all excited. And you know what? It's frustrating because I'm a voice crying in the wilderness, as you are. It's never going to change. It's too late. Uh, we're, we're on the, the downside, and we're about to be taken out under the fifth cycle of, of discipline. Okay. Uh, no, no murdering uh, of people. No taking life. No uh, illicit uh, sex. And see, here's, an, here's another thing we talked about. <clears throat> Just a few days ago, maybe it was yesterday, we had a National, national Kids Day. We got to do something about our kids. Okay, fine. So here we, on one hand, uh, tell them that children are having children, and they are, and it's wrong, and something should be done about it. However, the government shouldn't do it. Mom and dad should do it, if, if at all possible. Okay, but then you come up to people just like myself. I have for years said, you've got to be selective on things like rock and roll music. Now, not all rock and roll music is bad. You know, Little Deuce Coop and the surfing songs. Uh, there are other, not all rock and roll music is, is, uh, is, is wrong. I guess I'm dating myself, but that's, that's, that's okay. Little Deuce Coop's not rock and roll. Listen, I'm in the right category here. I played this stuff. I know what it is. Oh. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure I can. Uh, those songs are, are no, known, honestly, as rock and roll songs. But then, for example, I, I clicked on the the black rock and roll station, all right, where they had rapping music. Uh, and they had the, the, these groups rapping, making gestures and the like. All of them, I mean, some, some of the, uh, the black girls on there were some of those beautiful young ladies. I mean, I don't know where they get them. They must advertise. They're beautiful. And they were all scantily clad and, dress, and, and dancing as though they were performing sex. And throughout the whole song, the black girl was saying, and I'm doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. And what she was referring to was sex. And I'm doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. And behind this black guy saying, come on, baby. Well, come, we're going to do this. Come on, baby. And so, and, and then, then we wonder, they go from, from this situation, don't have the kids, and we put them right into these, these situations where that's all it is, is talking about ha performing the sex act. And then all of a sudden, surprise, uh, we've been to biology class, but we don't know where they, these come from. And over on the, this side, now all of a sudden, they have children, and children are having children. And moms and dads and, 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 and so forth, we just, we, we don't understand what's happening to our kids. You know what's happening? It's because they're getting the message of illicit sex in the music. And I could name you lyrics and so, but I wouldn't want to date myself again, uh, how far back I go with some of these lyrics. That's why I try to keep abreast with just a few of the songs. Okay. You know, I... I spend my life with my foot in my mouth. It's no, it's no wonder I have a bad neck. I do. I, do. I have a stub almost now. It's so bad. Okay, we'll go through a stealing line coveting. All right. <laughs> we need to go on here. The law is also broken up into two other ways of looking at it. We'll go to the left side first. <laughs> I, I, for, I just I, uh, lost my train of thought, but we'll get back on track here. All right. Numerically, it all works out. We don't have time to look at it. We will someday with regard to how they all fit together. But uh, just on one side, you know that five is the number of grace and life 
and the sustaining of life and so forth. It's interesting to note that there are five that have to do with God as creator and the giver of life. And it includes your parents. If you'll note it, we've got no other gods, no graven images or misconceptions of God, no blasphemy, assigning the name of God to something of which he is not, and remembering the true and living God because he uh, recreated in six days and sustained the environment for life. And then you know what he did? He made a man and a woman. And those first two parents take us all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Do you know that's exactly what your mom and dad did? Took us all the way back to the Garden of Eden. It is a facsimile of what we have in, in the original creation setting. Our mom and dad literally, uh, no, be, uh, even though it goes back 6,000 years, our mom and dad uh, reproduce, as it were, both the, uh, the garden setting and uh, the human race. So the source of life there is um, referred to. Then the last five has to do with the sanctity of life. If you simply keep these last five, uh, you would have no problems in society. You would have no problems with people if the last five of these were, were kept, the sanctity of life. Now the Lord Jesus Christ breaks them up into these two. In Matthew chapter 22, and verse number 35, then one of them, which was a liar, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law. Now what has he done? He has taken the first five, which talk about our relationship to the creator of our life, and he has taken the last five, which involves our relationship to creation and, uh, and men in general. Now, there is um, a second way in which the law is broken up, and if you turn to chapter 19, Now it's interesting that in both these passages, the first four commandments are omitted. And there's a reason for that. The last six commandments are those commandments that deal with divine establishment. It's for believer and unbeliever alike. An unbeliever may not know the true and living God, but the unbeliever, in order to function in life, to stabilize society and so forth, has to realize that the last six pertain to him. And here, is the, here are the commandments that religion hits. They forget the first four, that you have to have the true God as your Savior, but they hit the last six. And that is they are just simply moral rather than true morality or integrity having all ten. But in two cases, we're going to see where the Bible omits the first four, which simply means, even if you are an unbeliever, the last six commandments pertain to you, society, culture, the world, the proper functioning of man with man. All right, chapter 19, verse 16. One came to him and said, Good master, what good things shall I do to have eternal life? Why do you call me good? There's none good but one, that's God. But if you enter into life, keep the commandments. Okay? He said unto him, which? Now note which ones he said. Thou shalt do no murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor uh, your father and mother, and Thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. That's commandment 10. Don't covet anything that is your neighbor's. He translates that into loving your neighbor as yourself. You don't want your neighbor taking anything of yours, then don't take anything uh, of his. All these, uh, the young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. He was a moral young man with the last six. However, 
He had another God as his God, wealth, riches. Uh, Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, this is kingdom gospel now, go and sell what you have, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. But the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So, here is a classic example of one who was in measure moral. I've kept these things. That's why Paul said, hey, I had the righteousness which is uh, of the law. However, he didn't believe in the God <laughs> of the law. He omitted, uh, for personal application, the first four commandments, which deal with a relationship with God. Now, implication, four is the number of creation. And it has to do with the God who is our creator. He gave us life for a reason. Six is the number of man. So you have the first four dealing with our relationship with God, the last six dealing with the relationship with man. Paul does this in Romans 13. All right. Verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loves another has fulfilled the law. But I want you to see, he just includes, this is, this is Romans 13, verse 8. He only includes six of the Ten Commandments which tells us, and he uh, gives us an, an illustration here, that even an unsaved officer of the law should be obeyed. He is there by reason of ordination of God for our protection and praise if we do good, which means if we keep morality in the last six of the 10 commandments. For this, don't commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't, uh, don't covet. If there be any other commandment, it's briefly comprehended to this saying, namely, you'll love your neighbor as yourself because love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So it, it's dealing with basically man's relationship with man. Now let's move on to the, the last two points here. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Now, we have divided the law into separate parts. There are obviously ten. We can go astray in any one of the 10. We can be moral in one aspect, we've never murdered anybody, and yet we belittle our parents, we hate our parents, we disobey our parents. That is an immoral act. Even though we haven't murdered anybody, we're moral in that one area, but we're immoral in the other. It is broken up so that the first five point us back to the source of our life. We should keep them out of respect to our Creator who, who gave us life in the first place uh, by way of our first parents and then the um, our original uh, first parents and then uh, our own mom and dad. And then the sanctity of life. We should preserve it by respecting the person, the privacy, and the property of life. That's sanctity. Or, as four, with the God of creation, six, these things tell us about our relationship with man, how to make it work. But now the next point is the law is really undivided. It has integrity so that if you break one, you in effect break all of them. All right, let's see. James chapter 2. Let's look at um, verse 10. Whoso shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is actually guilty of all. We, don't, we will explain how that can be done later on. We've got to take it bit by bit here. For he that said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. 
Now, if you commit no adultery, okay, the illicit sex, that's not, that's not one sin that you have committed. Yet, if you kill, you are a, you've become a transgressor of the law. So you are, in effect, immoral. That is why we can say beyond a shadow of a doubt that though there are some religious people out there that have the first six down, say, or first, or excuse me, the last six down or any one of these, if they break one of them, they are immoral. If their God is wrong, if their conception of God is wrong, if they use God's name in vain, if they uh, neglect a, a church or what have you, on and on we can go, those people are immoral. It is a moral code. Not just two or three of them, but all ten of them are moral. So what? They've, they've not had an affair, yet they preach the wrong gospel. Their God is wrong. They are, they are stealing, they are lying, and so forth. Now let's go back to the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians, chapter 3. This is one of a couple of verses in the book of Galatians that talks about responsibility to the whole law, where a violation of one part is a violation in all actuality of all of it. Verse 10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now, note the phrase, all things. Why? Because if you offend in one part, one part can condemn you. Because it shows that you are in all actuality guilty of all. You are immoral. You are condemned by the law. Chapter 5, verse 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Now, the point that we are trying to make with this is simply, today we are being told that morality is the answer. Usually what they mean by that is murdering and sex and stealing and lying. But they forget that coveting can only be answered by the being saved, the Holy Spirit, and application of doctrine. And those things can only be answered by having the true God, the right conception of God, assigning his name where it belongs, and, and knowing his word, keeping the Sabbath principle, and thus honoring your parents in that way. That's the only way it's possible. So they limit their morality to just a few of the commandments rather than to all of the commandments. We, uh, we, we mentioned um, uh, Pat Robertson. He's a big name. So he says, let's, let's petition Washington to, to clean up our streets and get rid of drugs and clean up uh, you know, abortion and that sort of thing. Okay, fine. But on the other hand, he signs a, a peace pact with the Catholics saying that their doctrine is right. Well, is the man moral? No, he's not moral. He's lying because Catholic doctrine does not save. He is, he is bearing false witness. That is a lie. Therefore, he is not doing the will of the true and living God. He has broken that commandment. His conception of God is wrong and the will of God is wrong. He is blaspheming, saying that God simply sanctions a few things rather than sanctioning all of these things. And that's how that works, where one ends up in a breach of all. And you say, what about illicit sex? It has to do with unfaithfulness. You are unfaithful to, to the person that you are married to by telling them that there is another way to heaven aside from Jesus Christ. Or there is another will of God by, besides that which is revealed in his word. Unfaithfulness is, is um, uh, the besetting sin of all of these things. Unfaithfulness is, in essence, synonymous with immorality. They're unfaithful. Okay, let's uh, go on. Book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4. Just a few more verses. 
when Israel received the law, how many of the commandments did she as a nation have to live under? One, two, or all ten? Deuteronomy 4, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, verse 1, to the statutes, judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye might live and go in to possess the land. You'll not add to the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord. Now please note, we've got a lot, a lot of them here you're not allowed to add to or diminish from, but it's especially going to center around the 10. How do we know? Go to verse number 12. The Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude, only ye heard a voice. He declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even 10 commandments. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone. And he commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you do them. You see, these 10 are summary commandments. All of life fits under here, so that you have to have integrity to live a life pleasing to the Lord. There's only one way, and that's spirit filling. Chapter six in Deuteronomy. How many of these commandments were applicable? These are the commandments and statutes, verse one, and judgments which the Lord commanded to teach you, that you might do them that you might fear the Lord to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you. Verse number 24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord. All right, chapter 27 and verse 26 is our last verse. Half of Israel was told to go up on this mountain, mountain of blessing. Half of Israel was to go up on this mountain, the mountain of cursing. And they read the law and the people would uh, say, literally say, blessed is the man that does this, does this, and does this. Cursed is the man that does this, does this. Note the last curse. Verse number 26 of Deuteronomy 27. The do's and the don'ts of the Mosaic Code. Cursed be he that confirms not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. The violation of one part is a violation of all. God's curse is upon any violation of the law, pronouncing that person condemned guilty, immoral, unfaithful, and worthy of um, a measure of judgment what's ever assigned to the breaking of one of these. Now we have said all that to, we set out this morning to, to show that mere morality in a certain few aspects of the Ten Commandments or other codes, whether they're professional, social, or what have you, is not really God's will for your life. Does want you, God want you to be moral? Yes. But it's more than just moral in one or two areas. In order to be, have a life pleasing to the Lord, you must have true morality. Now, what is morality? It is uh, conducting yourself according to that which makes for good character and good conduct. It is behaving in a certain way, at certain principles involved, God's principles. But not just one or two of them, as we have shown, God's will for all of our lives is to go beyond that of mere morality to the point of integrity. Because breaking of one of these, is, say you break one, you keep the other nine, you still are um, considered by God to be a thorough lawbreaker and thoroughly immoral.